Thank you for joining us today on Edfile. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kassim. Louis Armstrong did What a Wonderful World in 1967 and since then, from Johnny Mitchell in the early 1970s, who did Big Yellow Taxi to Marvin Gaye's Mercy, Mercy Me in 1971, Michael Jackson's Earth Song in 1996, and Love Song to the Earth by some of the world's biggest names, including John McCartney, Bon Jovi, Sean Paul, and Angelic Kijo in 2015. There have been songs inspiring us to fight climate change. Unfortunately, we move to the tunes and forget the message they convey. But recently, I found myself thinking about these songs thanks to a discussion with a dear environment activist. And this conversation inspired today's focus on Edfound. Today on the program, we look at how art and indeed culture can help in saving our world. Do stay with us. In the morning. In 1989, Desmond and Sheila Majakodumi released Green Leaves in Lagos, Nigeria. The message was simple, let's not destroy what we cannot cure. Where will that leave us? Tell me, where will we be? For me, it started with an old song by um, a guy called uh, Satchmo, known as Louis Armstrong. And it was a song about um, what a wonderful world. You know, and he was singing about the beauty of this world. And I thought that was great. My parents used to listen to that sort of music. And then much later in the 70s, um, a, a, a lady in America came up with a song called uh, Yellow Taxi. Wow, and the lyrics of that song were so powerful that uh, the chorus was that they, they take paradise and they put up a parking lot, that they cut down all the trees, put them in a tree museum and charge people a dollar and a half just to see them. They take paradise and put up a parking lot. And this really infected me in the 70s. I thought, wow, how can we be taking paradise? And it's true, ah, uh -uh. you know, like Ikoi Park, for instance, you know, where I used to come all the time, Ikoi Park's in Lagos, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful park, you know, with lovely trees and nature and the lagoon and everything. And you know, here we are standing right here where Ikoi Park used to be. And there's so much concrete and there's so many roads and houses that there's actually no park to even view. <laughs> so this is a classic example of taking paradise and putting up a parking lot and an estate. So I was deeply influenced by that song. And when I met my dearly beloved departed wife now, late Sheila, wonderful singer. I got her to listen to the song and she really got inspired by it too. And that's what sort of started us on our move of using talent to project conservation. And as a result of that, we wrote many, many songs about the environment and released an album called Green Leaves. The environment was not something many people were talking about back then, but it was an issue the couple were passionate about and determined to cast light on. The album didn't generate much buzz in the Nigerian market, but it did earn them a meeting with the Duke of Edinburgh. Unfortunately, a lot of people didn't kind of like relate to it, to understand. In fact, the Duke of Edinburgh gave us a letter to take to Virgin Records in the UK. So I sold off my assets here and I said, yeah, we're going now international. And we went to Virgin Records, which was run by Richard Branson. And we presented the letter from the Duke of Edinburgh's uh, Buckingham Palace inviting us and we presented the record and they said yeah beautiful beautiful fantastic voice nice songs but um you can't have an album with all the songs about environment so we'll maybe take two songs and then we can have maybe six more songs that are commercial and i said no we can't do that what do you mean and we got up and we walked out of the office <laughs> yeah so people didn't kind of like relate to it in those days. Today, we are catching up to what they were trying to do musically then. Many believe Green Leaves was an album that was ahead of its time. And what sounded completely uncommercial and out of place in 1989 sounds fresh and contemporary more than three decades later. Now, when we're seeing what's happening, when we're seeing the reaction 
of the terrible damage that we've been causing Mother Nature. We've seen fires all over the place in 2019, in California, and then in Brazil, and then in Australia. And these fires, massive fires, they were predicted by the scientists over 10 years ago. They said fires will be happening in these places because of global warming. And then we're seeing hurricanes hitting places where they've never hit before, like the Bahamas and so on. So the reality of the situation is now dawning on people. And hopefully, the musicians and the artists and the creative world out there will use their talent in a far more responsible way to alert people about the need to care for this wonderful, wonderful creation. In 2019, there was arguably no bigger global issue than climate change. And there are signs that this is becoming the new cause for today's pop stars and cultural icons. Google Trends data shows that more people are searching for climate change today than at any time since 2009, the year that the United Nations brought 110 world leaders together at an unprecedented climate change conference in Copenhagen. That so many people would be asking questions about climate change without the glow of a large political conference seems significant today. This shift in public attention towards climate change has happened at the same time as global demonstrations and school strike protests led by the social media savvy climate campaigner Greta Thunberg. This price is not only for me, this is for the whole Fridays for Future movement. But the art space still has a big gap to fill. Polya Lakuja is the chair of the Lagos Art and Culture Council and at the forefront of advocating for inclusive water solutions through creative social change. Her Five Calories Art Education Initiative focuses on my story of water. It is targeted at enhancing teaching skills for positive educational and environmental outcomes. In our teaching practice, in the programs we've been involved in, there's recurrent things and recurrent themes that come up time and time again. So one of the projects we run is My Story of Water. And this has come from years of working in schools, working in communities. And the number one issue is always water, access to water. So every time we go into a community, the first thing on our list that we have to take is literally buckets and sometimes even jerry cans of water. Um, if you're working, particularly in Lagos State, I have to say that almost all the water we have access to is actually polluted. So my story of water was a natural one. Um, it also spun off um, a program we've been involved in in the last three, four years with an event, the festival in London, the Totally Thames Festival, which at the heart is an educational, international educational program. Um, looking at communities living on waterways in an urban environment and getting children and teachers to explore issues around urban living on waterways globally, collaborating um, and really educating young people and getting them to be aware of the need to protect our environment and our waterways for a healthier and happier community. In Lagos State alone, approximately 25% of children drop out at primary level and 60% do not complete secondary education. But Polly's work is to leverage the arts to offer inclusive pathways to education that are responsive to individual learning, social, and cultural needs. Fundamentally, if you ask, you know, what is the most fundamental need we all have on a daily basis? It tends to always come back to water. So water is a big story for us. So we've developed this project, My Story of Water. And what we try and do is, you know, each community is very specific. Each family is specific. So we all have our own individual stories of water. So we try not to be too prescriptive in what that story is. But invariably, common themes are coming back to us. And I would say about 70, 75 percent of those common themes relate to the environment. The lack of access to clean water, um, pollution issues, issues around disease because the water is polluted. And invariably that leads on to questions around waste management and recycling and all of that. So it's a very natural conversation. So we don't want to be too prescriptive. Um, so we try and get basic concepts across, like really let's think about the water cycle. Please let's really think about where water comes from, where it goes to, and what are our responsibilities and choices along the way. And we all, as individuals, have choices and make decisions that impact not only on us, but our families and our communities.
One of the most prominent urban problems Nigerian cities face is not only the physical degradation of its historical city centers, but also the degradation of their social, economic, and environmental context. Moreover, common rehabilitation methods and strategies are often unsuccessful combating such problems. Experts believe new ways and strategies must be researched, tested, and implemented under a new sustainable development policy. They believe creativity and artistic activities can play an important role in the resolution of this problem. For example, the reoccupation of derelict buildings through creative and innovative activities can contribute to resolving the primary issue. And when you ask, pick somebody, an average person on the street, let's say, and you ask them, what is art? It's very easy for somebody to dismiss art and say, oh, I'm not interested in art, it's elitist, it's not relevant to me. Mm -hmm. They have a valid point. But then if you ask the same person, what is culture, what does culture mean to you? Very quickly they'll say, oh, culture is how we live, it's who we are. Whether that's um, how we party, how we enjoy music, how we socialize, how we hang out with our friends, how we get married, how we bury people. Um, the culture of food, the culture of how we get together as a family, the culture of work, the workplace culture, how we commute, all of that, that's all culture. So people understand that. So kind of say that, you know, art could be seen as a um, manifestation of that culture. Um, it can be a celebration of the culture. It can be a commentary. It can also be a criticism, yeah? So as I just said, I kind of feel that you could say that artists could have a responsibility to help guide the culture and be that little voice that says, hang on a minute, we could do this differently. Without selling your soul, without selling your culture, there could be another way of doing this. Um, and artists are particularly skilled in being able to communicate and put the issue across um, in an imaginative way that might highlight that issue. Um, I think too we should look at arts quite broadly as well, um, not just look at fine art, painting, um, let's look at our music industry, I mean like, wouldn't it be awesome, look at our, uh, I mean Nigeria is blessed with music, the whole world now listens to music from Nigeria, imagine if our young musicians took on the environmental story as one of the things they want to talk about and influence young people through that, imagine if Nollywood sort of started putting some soft messaging into what they're portraying in their stories. You don't need to dull down the stories, but just gently bring that messaging in. So we can like just gently start changing our ways. Increasing role of art in addressing such pressing issues. The Ben Enwamu Foundation, during its monthly series of talks known as Point of View, decided to focus on the role of art and the quest to save the earth. The, foundation the fourth edition themed Art as a Driver for Environmental Sustainability advocates for sustainable cities and communities by promoting interdisciplinary collaborations between professionals across such diverse sectors as government, the art, science and technology to highlight the significant role of the visual arts in ensuring policy frameworks that address climate change. These are the very tenets that Ben who as early as the 1950s was hailed as Africa's greatest artist. These were, very, were themes that were very dear to him and you know, he projected all through his over 60 year career. So in sustaining his legacy, we're, we're not only you know, preserving that legacy or sustaining the legacy, but in doing so, we're projecting his ideas, you know, we're researching his ideas. You know, these are ideas that made him great, you know, and these are ideas that are still relevant today. Considering the current standpoint and outlook on rehabilitation as an action and movement of sustainability, especially at the environmental level and associating it with art and culture movement, we allow it to solve the social and economic problems simultaneously. Culture experts say by introducing new dynamic living spaces in unoccupied and derelict buildings also re-energizes the economic value of the building as well as, most importantly, regenerating the actual city. When considering ecological sustainability or environmental impact, most people think immediately of energy use reduction. Comprehensively addressing environmental responsibility requires attention not only to energy and carbon emissions,
but also to a number of other critical factors. In the arts, this includes such things as toxic materials, recycling and reuse indoor air quality, and transportation, as well as artistic content. When we hear headlines that Lagos will sink in the next 30 years in 2050, you know, we as artists you know, have a role to play. You know, how can we raise awareness through forums like this, fora like this, you know, to the government, policy makers, you know, and even to everyone who has a role to play, because each and every one of us, from the small child to the adult, we all have a role to play. Is it from gas emissions? You know, what sort of generators are we using? You know, how do we generate our power supply, for instance? You know, uh, are we using inverters, which is a better option? Are we using solar energy, solar panels, which is another, it's another good option? You know, what is the government doing, for instance? You know, are they burning off our crude oil and all the gas emissions that come from there? Or are they harnessing that to even harness more energy, for instance, you know? You know, liquefied natural gas. What is the state of that? You know, today. You know, you now, what sort of paper do we use when we are printing our wedding invitation cards and invitation cards to parties? Are we using recycled uh, paper, for instance, which will be better instead of felling more and more trees? You know, which the trees, of course, clean the air. You know, for us to breathe in better. You know, and make the and decrease the rate of deterioration. For instance, bags when we go shopping. Are we using, still using plastic bags that are not biodegradable, for instance? You know, so everyone has a role to play. A popular model known as the three E's of sustainability asserts that holistic sustainability addresses the environment, the economy and social equity rather than just one or two of those issues. The arts have deep experience addressing economic concerns as well as important social issues. Ecological concerns have largely been a distant third. One interpretation of the three pillars of sustainability submits that since the economy exists within society and society exists within the natural environment, action at the environmental level is the most critical for improving the likelihood of long-term societal and economic sustainability. Many artists in Nigeria have been focusing on the impact of human activities on nature. Dotun Popola's works look at this and more. Most, most of my pieces are actually used as a metaphor to, to negotiate and dialogue, create a narrative about my economy, the social cultural activities of Nigeria, and um, to create a narrative of Africa as a whole. Then also to reinvent and reinform the populace about the folk tales and folklores. I mean the African folk tales and folklores that are probably going to extinction. So taking Nigeria as a case study. I'm inspired by this nation and the nature around me. I'm inspired by situations I like to protest the issue of waste. So now, using waste as a narrative, using discarded material to give hope to the hopeless and to also talk about how life can be given to dead situations, like dead materials. So it is very important for me to use my work to bring life, to bring hope, to, and to use it to communicate to, you know, the broken heart. So a lot of things inspires me, but I love my work to be a metaphor to the next person. Taking action on environmental sustainability demands new ways of thinking and requires overcoming the inertia of the way things have always been done. Cultivating environmental literacy and implementing new or different activities are often seen as additional buildings and as secondary to the support of existing organizational missions. Arts organizations, unlike zoos, aquariums, or nature centers, find environmental sustainability tougher to connect to their missions or to an existing set of guiding principles. Arts and culture is cool, creativity is cool and fun. So like, even if you can say, you're an average man on the street and you say, oh, art doesn't interest me, it's too elitist, actually think about it. What about the music that you listen to? It's cool and it's fun and it's going to engage you. And if through something that you enjoy, there's some messaging embedded in that, you're going to remember it and you're going to remember it for a very long time. At the end of the day, if you have an experience that's awesome and wonderful and magic, 
you're going to remember it. So that's what, for me, that's what art is. Um, you know, if you have to define art, which is very difficult to do, um, mm -hmm. my personal opinion would be art has got to have an element of magic. It's got to have a wow factor. It has to stop me dead in my tracks, yeah? And those are the moments that you remember. So whether the art that you celebrate is music or film or visual arts or sculptural installations, let it be something that stops anybody dead in their tracks. Your average commuter on the street, I want them to be stopped dead in their tracks and be moved by something. But then that something must have a strong message. So that person remembers it. Over many years, the arts community has created a robust advocacy infrastructure to support arts legislation and funding. Arts practitioners generally have relationships with elected officials around the world who support the arts. Successful environmental organizations have cultivated relationships with political figures as well. Without collaboration with environmental organizations or direct familiarity with environmentally engaged policymakers, art groups miss important opportunities. Additionally, lacking understanding of the environmental goals of art supporters, advocates and policymakers is a barrier to effective action and a missed opportunity for collaboration and revenue. Um, so can we get it right? I don't know, but you have to hope. Uh, look at Kenya, the ban on yes. single-use plastics. They've managed to do it. I mean, I was last in Kenya about 15 years ago. There's plastics everywhere, and now they have cleaned up their, their shops. So, like, it is possible to make that difference. Um, you just need to get the right policies in place. You need to enforce those policies. And they need arts and culture is there to back it up. Um, and also, I believe that you know, our cultural space has a responsibility to keep reminding our policymakers that this is an issue. Um, and it's an issue that has popular support. Culture has popular support. So the demographics will support the necessary change. But many believe this can change. When we think about the ways in which we can shape environmental health, sustainability, biodiversity and environmental justice, art or even music may not be the first topic that comes to mind. But researchers and art experts recognize this gap between art and the environment and are eager to feel it. You know that it's not just a Nigerian problem, that it's a global problem. United Nations is taking note now. You know, so I think there's more emphasis now because it's getting more alarming. You know, all over the world, it's no longer a Nigerian problem, it's all over the world now. You know, so what United Nations is doing, look at what governments are doing, and the fact that as Nigerians, you know, in the next 30 years, one in every three black people will be Nigerian. That tells you the enormous amount of responsibility on us. The most black nation in the world, you know, we've got to absolutely take the lead. There is actually a plan for the tree planting song to get a whole bunch of top artists together and sing the let us plant a tree today. Make the rain fall, keep the desert away. Uh -huh. Let us plant a tree today. Make the rain fall, keep erosion a day. So we want to get some of the top artists together and do this song for the upcoming tree planting that will be happening in a few months time. And it's part of the Nigerian 25 million tree project that the government has launched, which is also in tandem with the one trillion trees project that has been launched globally. So we're quite excited about that. And we want to see everybody not just singing the song, but actually practicing what they're singing about. The King of Pop said of the Earth song, quote, with the ecological unbalance going on and a lot of the problems in the environment, I think Earth feels the pain and she has wounds and it's about some of the joys of the planet as well. But this is my chance to pretty much let people hear the voice of the planet. And this is F song, unquote. So I'm hoping each one of us will stop to notice this crying earth, this weeping shores. That's our program for the week. We hope to be back with you next week. From all of us here in Lagos, it's bye for now.